uh, I'm glad you're all here. I, it seems to be there's still a few empty chairs, but we'll go forward as we are. Um, the first speaker is Chuck Lewis, uh, somebody who um, we had a, a significant knowledge of his work uh, when we first started here 12 years ago because the Center for Public Integrity in Washington uh, was a signal place for a lot of us uh, to give up an emphasis uh, on government corruption and government malfeasance and all the rest of it, and mass murder, if you will. Uh, and the only people really documenting that in a systemic, organized fashion at that point in the states was really the Center for Public Integrity, amongst others. And further, they also had an enormous influence on us because the center itself also had data and serious work done on data. In fact, one of the, one of the guys that I first met at the center is now the head of all digital at The Guardian, Aaron Pilhofer. Um, and they were doing invaluable work in data processing, um, which was unique then at that time to the Center for Public Integrity. Um, the founder is Chuck Lewis, and he's here and going to speak next. And he's just written a book uh, documenting the 935 lies of the former U.S. presidency. Uh, I'm sure we can do the same thing in the next one, but, the, but it's a, an invaluable exercise. But towards that end, a man that many of you will already know, Chuck Lewis. Sorry, I'll explain that in a sec. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's great to be here, and I, I just want to say, Gavin uh, and Sarah and everyone, uh, everyone that's participated, this is an amazing conference. Most uh, journalists go to journalism conferences, and they don't get out much uh, and uh, outside their realm. And so that the interplay of all these interesting and all public-minded folks in one room is somewhat unusual, at least in my experience. Um, and, and the Logan family and the foundation made it possible. Um, so um, I wanted to, we're only talking about the future of truth, a small subject here. And in fact, it's a very short subject. It's, 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 I'm gonna spend more time looking backwards uh, naturally, but um, that's what journalists do. Um, anyway, I've uh, been doing investigative reporting like many here uh, for many years, over 30 years, and uh, I, uh, was at ABC C News and CBS News, working with Lowell at, at 60 Minutes and others, and quit one day because they spiked my story uh, for the not the first time. And so uh, I started the Center for Public Integrity from my house. A few years later, started the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, and we have journalists here, uh, Nikki Hager and Duncan Campbell, and in London, of course, Philip Knightley and others. So this is 185 journalists now in, in 65 countries on six continents doing the first reporting across borders uh, systematically from journalists from all, all over different organizations. Um, so uh, it, so it's, it's been a little bit of a strange, uh, what's that long strange journey it's been? <laughs> that would be what we're describing here. I ran it for 15 years. Uh, Bill Busenberg is stepping down after eight years and Peter Bale is in the audience, the next uh, leader of the center and the International Consortium. Um, uh, so anyway, um, I, uh, we did do systematic, just a, a sentence on that. We did books like The Buying of the President uh, in 96, 2000, 2004, looking at every penny in the life of presidential candidates over decades and looking at their top 10 career patrons to see what the, those folks got back for their money, which of course was a lot. And we looked at the buying of the Congress with 1,200 interviews, 36 researchers, writers, editors. So. We were anal retentive in the extreme. There's no other way to describe it. We looked at corruption in all 50 states back in uh, the 90s. We were working with 45 newspapers in 45 states. So we, we, we do these kind of gone with the wind epic things. Uh, um, and, and that would, it, it probably, and I, on national security, since a lot, obviously a lot of this conference is about that subject, we're, we weren't the only ones to do this, but we, had, we did a report called The Business of War in 2002, tracking the 90 uh, biz, uh, private military companies on planet Earth, including Kellogg, Brown, and Root, which was, of course, part of Halliburton. Uh, in uh, 04, uh, sorry, 03, we posted the Patriot II Act against the wishes of the Attorney General. We were told that we'd be very sorry if we published that within two weeks of the invasion of Iraq. We published it anyway, quoted, whoever said that, and um, had 350,000 unique visitors and 15 million hits and 100 news stories the next day, including in the Post, Washington Post and New York Times. 
Um, and we, um, we posted all the Iraq and Afghanistan war contracts. Uh, because of the web, it enabled you to see who was getting rich from war uh, in real time during the war. And we filed 73 Freedom of Information Act requests. And uh, we went to federal court. Uh, Halliburton, of course, did not want its $7 billion no-bid contract released. Funny how that works. And um, we, got, we got it in the courts, and we posted all those contracts within six to 12 months, the first six months, most of them. I think Halliburton took us a few more months to get it. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, mischief that the center does, and it's just as you, most of, many in Europe would know, of course, the, the uh, secrecy bank records things that have been going on both uh, in uh, Luxembourg and, and also more largely the world. <laughs> Uh, with dozens of uh, laws starting to change in countries because of that report involving 115 journalists in 55 or 60 countries, which I think might be the biggest single collaboration ever. Um, so I, I left the center at some point. The founder has to leave the building uh, if it's going to actually be an institution. And um, I, I now run the investigative reporting workshop uh, at American University. We, we've done front lines, uh, co-produced co front line documentaries, six of them. Showtime on climate change, uh, partnered with the New York Times on immigration detention, solitary confinement, the New Yorker regarding the Koch brothers and the, the uh, climate change uh, legislation dying in Washington, uh, not coincidentally. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of where I'm coming from. At the end of 04, I, I, I realized that, that I had um, my whole life focused on uh, this old cliche, watch what they do, uh, sorry, watch what they say, not what they do. And investigative journalists generally assume that those in power lie. <laughs> Call it, I know we're so cynical. But um, uh, so most of the time, journalists are really focused on contracts and uh, you know, uh, agreements and, and charters and emails and leaks, yes. But, but it's usually the substance of the material, not, not the statements. And also, of course, we also distrust public relations people. That's another understatement here. Um, and so uh, as a result, um, I didn't really, I ignored all those folks. And then I noticed at the end of 2004, just a few months as I'm stepping down, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, among other things, I, I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting? I, I noticed that 60% of Americans at the end of 04 and early 05 still thought there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq a year after George W. Bush himself said they didn't find them. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, I'm not a deep philosopher, but <laughs> I think, what does it mean if the public actually doesn't want to accept the truth? And as late as 2012, 60% of Republicans still, in some polls, still believe they were there. And I thought, well, that's kind of, whoa, I mean, I should probably go to a shrink or something. This is serious stuff. And then I thought, well, but also, what's it say about journalism if fa facts don't matter anymore? Uh, we have a serious uh, professional crisis about what we do. So this anal retentive DNA thing is a real problem because then I got eight or nine researchers, and we looked at every false and erroneous statement made by President Bush, Dick Cheney, the vice president, and six other top officials. And we worked for two and a half years and did a 380,000 word database of every utterance that fit that, um, the, the criteria. And we did a report called Iraq the War Card and we uh, issued it on the, I gave it to the center to release. I had left the center, but I thought that that would be a good thing. It was a five year anniversary of the invasion. And um, it was covered massively around the world. BBC did three stories, uh, NPR Morning Edition, uh, AP, New York Times had it first. And, uh, the White House, of course, denounced it within hours, uh, not surprising. Um, <clears throat> and so then I realized, of course, and I, I did know this, I'm not, not as dumb as I look, uh, I, I actually did realize that this has happened before uh, as a student of history like we all are. And so, of course, I felt the need to start looking at all of these issues and going back, uh, hold on to your seats, uh, 50 plus years. Uh, the other obvious war, which we've had, I don't know if he's still in here, but Dan Ellsberg, uh, the Vietnam War, where 58,000 U.S. military alone died. Uh, Iraq, as you're probably aware, that war has cost, uh, in just the U.S. alone, $2 trillion, 60 to 80,000 contractors or soldiers from the U.S. Uh, will be permanently disabled the rest of their life. 
and of course hundreds, 100,000 and probably far higher of civilian casualties. Um, so uh, these are obviously immensely serious issues. Vietnam, uh, the casualties, of course, were massive. Uh, and in terms of US military casualties, it, casualties far worse, actually, than, than Iraq. Um, and so um, I, I went back and revisited all that, the Pentagon Papers, the, uh, the, the gaps in time, the fact that the President of the United States is telling Americans, I'll not, we're not gonna, I'm not going to send uh, our boys to Vietnam. He always had, always had problems pronouncing that country's name. Uh, and of course, meanwhile, there are secret memos about Operation Rolling Thunder. They're going to put a 500,000 boots on the ground and, or more uh, the following <laughs> spring. And of course, for months, they knew the US was invading the land, water, and air space of North Vietnam prior to the quote unquote attack that actually did not occur on August 4, 64. So, the, the public doesn't really understand the full dimension, of course, until 1971, thanks to Daniel Ellsberg and, and the uh, Pentagon Papers, New York Times, Washington Post, and other papers breaking that, and the U.S. Supreme Court almost censoring that, but allowing it an am amazing moment in U.S. history. Um, but I, then I kept going back. I went back to the McCarthy years, uh, the Red Scare in the U.S., um, and, and examined the role of lying and false statements, the media's role, which was not particularly courageous initially. Uh, everyone had to take a loyalty oath about the CIA at, at all three networks. Dozens of reporters were fired because they were seen as either disloyal or undependable about their political views. Um, I looked at race issues, uh, which I, this is way before Ferguson, and I looked systematically at uh, the fact that the New York Times didn't have a bureau in the southern part of the United States until 1947. They had a bureau here in Paris and some other very nice cities, but not the south. And um, of course, the Brown versus Board case and uh, lots of other things, are, it's too long to go deep in it. But I interviewed leading and civil rights activists who are still live living from that period. I've talked to Cy Hirsch, and this is what this project became. I started to also look at great moments in where the journalists got it right, <laughs> that would not be Iraq, <laughs> and that would, and and even Vietnam. Obviously, uh, we we had a war resolution within six days of the foe invasion, uh, the foe attack. I mean, on August fourth, within six days, there was a war resolution. That's how bad it was. Eighty-five percent of America's newspapers and saluted, started singing the Star Spangled Banner, and you know we went to war. Um, so those two wars, with the except the best reporting was obviously the Pentagon Papers, which was leaked. And the other best reporting was Cy Hirsch, who was not in Vietnam. He's in Washington, a freelancer. He can't get anyone in Washington. 30, three zero news organizations would not publish the story um, because who's this guy? He's a freelance writer, et cetera. So anyway, um, uh, but obviously the huge stories when they finally did occur. But most of the reporting about Vietnam was dutiful and, and quite patriotic, and there were not um, it was not particularly uh, impressive reporting for the most part. There were great moments of individual war correspondents, some of whom were killed. I'm not saying there weren't folks in the field, but, but overall the coverage was relatively uh, lo loyal and deferential. Um, of course, the Watergate scandal uh, for this, I, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through the site, but there's 51 produced segments totaling four hours, uh, luminaries like uh, uh, my former colleague, Lowell Bergman, uh, but uh, Cy Hirsch, uh, Carl Bernstein, who, who I worked for for a year, uh, uh, Bob Woodward, um, Ben Bradley, who just died, um, and, and lots of journalists uh, going back, well, 50 plus years, the man who brought down Senator McCarthy, who just died a year ago, Murray Martyr at age 93, who studied every move McCarthy made for four years, uh, literally in-depth journalism in real time, and he was the one who, asked questions that were inconvenient that set up the famous army hearings that brought down McCarthy. Um, how many journalists today can spend four years on any story just that? Uh, that's, that's kind of revealing in a way. Ber Bernstein and Woodward did several hundred stories, and they were on that story for two and a half full years. They had a Watergate editor, Barry Sussman, who, I, who put them together, who I interviewed, who's still around, thankfully. and, and um, so. When I look at great moments of truth in the last half century, journalism, when it's done exceptionally well, takes time, it costs money, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we know that 
uh, I'll come around the bend about journalism. Journalism, obviously, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, commercial journalism, we've lost about 15 or more thousand uh, commercial journalists. But meanwhile, there's 100 nonprofits. When Lowell and three other journalists started the Center for Investigative Reporting in 1977, it was the first nonprofit doing investigative reporting in, in the world, as far as I know, the US certainly. And uh, the Center for Public Integrity was the second. Now there's 100 of them. Now, not all of them are strictly as hardcore investigative as CPI and CIR, uh, but, but there's still something really interesting happening. The diaspora of immensely talented journalists moved to the nonprofit space. But anyway, if you go to the top, I'm not gonna play around in the site, but if you go to the top of this site, it has interviews and, and bio profiles of, of the um, 25 journalists. I'm still adding, I just interviewed Betty Metzger who did the COINTELPRO story about FBI surveillance of Americans. And um, uh, so that'll go up soon. I hope to do 40 or 50 of these interviews by the time I'm finished. And um, that was the first time, to my knowledge, that American newspaper had secret classified records and they were asked by the FBI not to publish and they said we're publishing anyway and Ben Bradley went to Catherine Graham, argued we got to publish and they published the COINTEL story. That's two or three months before the Pentagon Papers actually. So it's a, most journalists and even I'd say most people don't know what I just said. That's sort of an un, some of the secrets of the recent past that we some of us lived through are all, some of them still just coming out. It's very strange but true. Um, the one other part of, uh, so anyway, I, I've neglected to mention, oh, by the way, I did this book <laughs> uh, called 935 Lies, uh, which is the false statements that we tracked, but the publisher wanted to use the L word, so we did, and uh, uh, which I'm fine with. I, if you notice the memoirs, I don't recommend anyone read the, this stuff, but if you read uh, Bush and Cheney's and uh, Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell and all these folks' memoirs, they all have the same phrase. Um, they all say that they had bad intelligence, which I, I, you could fill in the, the laugh line there. I'm not, I, I, I'll let you fill it in. It's, it speaks for itself. But none of them had any, like the slightest contrition or apology or humility about what, what occurred here uh, with that. I, the biggest lies, though, in U.S. history that have caused the largest loss of life or not the Holocaust, it's not World War I or World War II, it's not any of the things that we're talking about. It's actually tobacco. Uh, uh, there, there were, according to the World Health Organization, 100 million people died from smoking in the 20th century. This century will be one billion. Why? Because ever since the late 70s, every U.S. trade representative part of the White House for every president, since Jimmy Carter to today with Barack Obama, they have all uh, helped tobacco companies pry open markets around the world in the name of free trade so that they can um, grow tobacco, sell tobacco, and make sure, of course, children and others buy it. And so the exponential numbers of who will smoke will grow as the older countries like Britain and the U.S. who first their surgeon generals or health officials started noticing it was killing people back in the, actually, U.K. was ahead of the U.S. Uh, two or three years. But anyway, there's a whole chapter on tobacco. Why? Because for 60 years, from 1940 to 2000, uh, journalists had trouble telling that story. Um, and um, I, I go, f I, I'll spare you, but I go through every example that I've ever heard of, and it's quite a number, from George Seldes, who starts a newsletter called In Fact. He's mad because a Associated Press and Reader's Digest are the only two telling people that there's studies showing it smoking kills, which, of course, the tobacco industry denies. Um, and, and all the way up, of course, to, yes, uh, The Insider uh, at the end of the, or in the mid-90s, but you have two other documentaries uh, that I talk about, one that was killed outright the same day as another one, the, the network settled. I'll spare you all the details, but if you want to know all the examples of problems where journalists in the U.S. could not cover tobacco, it's pretty disgusting. Uh, and um, I could tell you a lot of stories, but it would be wrong because uh, there's a time thing here. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but if you want to hear them, I'll tell you. I, I had some of my own, and actually, as I mentioned, I, one of my stories was spiked. It wasn't as dramatic as uh, the insider. Uh, but it was another thing that bothered me, and uh, it wasn't the last straw. It was not the first story spike, but it was the last one because I walked and, and broke a four-year contract and had a mortgage and a uh, wife and a nine, eight or nine-year-old daughter and 
um, no savings. Other than that, it was a really good idea. <laughs> so I started the center with two friends who didn't know each other on the board and naturally had to be in charge of it. Um, um, the, the thing that you've been passed out, just to close the loop on some of the truth things, um, I, I just want to show you how bad this is. Our biggest problem, and there's been other discussions about, for those of you who don't have it, I'll get it up on the, um, there's a, a website for the book called 935lies.com. And I'll get this, this, this is my favorite part of the book, uh, the appendix. Uh, uh, but it, it actually has examples. Let me tell you how bad this is. We find out the truth, not like a week later, not a, not a month later, not a year later. We find out decades later how bad things are. And, and that's in the, the so-called good old days when we had many more journalists, uh, commercial journalists. And so if you look at, um, I'll just give a few examples. Oh, gosh, where do I start? There's so many. Um, I have 20 here, 10 and 10. I'm just going to do a handful, just a few. Lead paint. There is an ad campaign focusing on children and saying lead paint helps guard your health. And it was on, in the walls of schools in 1923. Uh, and they promoted it in hospitals as well. Uh, in the U.S., at least, Nixon, uh, President Nixon signs the Lead-Based Paint Poisoning Prevention Act. The first real new, major news stories in the U.S., at least, were in 1943, 20 years later, um, and later in the 50s with CBS and Parade. Uh, asbestos. Uh, the industry executives knew their product was killing people way back in the 1930s. Their internal memos, 1934. Uh, the first major comprehensive scientific study that it kills was 1964. We're talking 30 years, right? And the first uh, most substantial journalism is Paul Brodeur in uh, New Yorker in 1968 and, and others that follow. Uh, British, uh, the British uh, decided black lung was a compensable condition back in 1943, coal miners uh, and, and, and dust standards. And, the U.S. doesn't get around to doing it until 25 years later, roughly. 1969, the U.S. passes the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act. The first uh, notable reporting in the U.S., many would say, is in the 1960s uh, by journalists, because there's a West Virginia coal mine disaster. Um, and um, so that's some of the things. But on, on government, uh, uh, besides what we just talked about with Vietnam, uh, the, maybe the most outrageous single one, but I don't know. You tell me. There's so many. Um, uh, the U.S. Public Health Service launched uh, a study into um, uh, how syphilis, how people who have syphilis die. And um, so they, they, they gave uh, uh, uninformed black men, uh, part, yeah, okay, sorry. They gave un uninformed uh, black males, uh, 600 of them, uh, placebo pills, useless pills, telling them they were being cured. They all, of course, die. Um, the public doesn't find out about this for 40 years, till 1972, when, when uh, someone inside the Public Health Service leaked it to Jean Heller of the AP, Associated Press. Uh, the radiation experiments, um, uh, when thousands of people were exposed, and in some cases, people were injected with plutonium. Can you imagine getting a shot from the doctor and plutonium? Um, that's not made public and revealed until Eileen Wilson does a series in the Albuquerque Tribune in 1993, and the president uh, at the time, Clinton, uh, takes a commission report that lays out the whole uh, misleading things that happened there. Anyway, you get the idea. It's really quite, quite ex extensive. Now, what does that mean for the future? Well, it means <laughs> we have a problem here. We've never gotten it right in real time, to my hardly ever, exceedingly rarely. One of the few times we got it right, journalists, I mean, was uh, actually when someone mentioned El Salvador today, uh, the El Masote massacre, uh, Alma Guillermo Prieto of the Washington Post, and um, gosh, the New York Times reporter I'm, I'm blanking on. Ray yeah, Ray Bonner, sorry, who I talked to in the book. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, and both of them uh, had the story, hundreds of, of dead bodies over a period of over um, over a you know, little area of ground in a little village called El Masot. The U.S. government knows about it. It's on page one of both newspapers. Susan Mizellis, a uh, Pulitzer-winning photographer, takes a photo that's in both, pa both papers. That story goes all over the world. The Reagan administration testifies and says, you know, actually, we think they're really improving in human rights, <laughs> and completely ignored this. And they also said that the left 
was trying to distort uh, you know, foreign policy. The truth emerges 10 years later with a truth commission by the UN in El Salvador where they literally dig up the bones, hundreds of skeletons, and oh yes, by the way, US made bullets um, uh, from the massacre we were helping the government of El Salvador. So th it took, that's a case where they got it right in real time within days of the massacre, but then they were spun by the White House to not do it. So we, we know enough from just recently with Iraq and, and even what's happening now with Iraq 3, how easily the press is bamboozled. It could be related that we have five times more public relations people today than we did back in 1960 uh, when Kennedy and Nixon debated and we had a, a, a big election back then. Anyway, so that when you have that many people spinning, uh, you have the government has its own TV channel, the Pentagon News Channel, and they're sending out video news releases uh, to, uh, and there's uh, 100 million people exposed during the Iraq war to videos prepared by the Bush administration paid by taxpayers. That's the most outrageous part of all. No, I'm just kidding. But um, uh, it, it's, you can see why we're bamboozled. Obama has more people spinning than Bush did in the White House. Bush had more than Clinton. There's fewer reporters, full-time professional reporters in the White House today than there were under Bush and then after. So these trends are all fairly disturbing. And that's why this conference is so important because the role of citizens, uh, the, the role of public interest-minded folks who are gathering information in various ways, whether it's, yes, uh, leaked material, whether it's whistleblowers go coming forward or both, or, uh, and yes, public interest-minded journalists, which we could use more of, by the way. Um, all of those things will, will help change this dynamic, but the dynamic, the tradition, the pattern is journalists get it late. They don't get it first, they get it last. And investigative reporting is not daily reporting. And um, obviously, and even daily reporting is mostly frequently, too frequently, there's a need for it, yes, but stenography, taking down what they said, which of course could be bloviating uh, when you have 935 statements all made by the same, the same basic statements by eight people. Uh, David Barstow won the Pulitzer Prize. He, he found emails, thousands of pages of Freedom of Information materials. He found emails from the Pentagon directly to 75 generals who were, and admirals who were expert, former generals, of course, but a third of them were contractors getting rich from military contracts, and they were all doing objective, independent analysis on TV, whether it's saying the war was going very well, and that Guantanamo is a really pretty nice place. They, they went down on uh, the vice president's personal jet, and they thought it seemed fine to them. Um, and um, that's what passes for coverage, and it's what passes for truth. And we have to do better. And I, um, I, I guess I should stop there. I could go on for about a couple of days, uh, but it would be wrong. And, uh, thank you very much. Yeah.